Racing is dangerous. This is the greatest showman. He is floating on air now. It's the multicultural AFL footy show with Vanessa Gatica, Abir Singh Kang, Vlad Andrewas and George Grossios. Hello and welcome to the Multicultural AFL Foodie Show. I am Vanessa and on tonight's remote panel are Javier and George and Fouad in Adelaide. Hello guys. Hi everybody. The second week of the AFL final series produced an emphatic response from the Yellow Cats at Optus in Perth when they bounced back to defeat the struggling GWS Giants without the suspended Toby Green failing miserably by 35 points. Over at the GABA, Brisbane went head-to-head -head with the Western Bulldogs in a classic AFL Finals match, which had everything a footy fan could wish for. In a one-point thriller won by the Western Bulldogs with a late rush behind in the dying seconds of the game, giving the Doggies a shot at Port Adelaide next week for the right to enter the grand final. The Brisbane Lions now have to soul search for another year to second year in a row of going out in a straight sets. No great surprise that Lockie Neal wants out. Going back to Western Australia. Javier, let us know your thoughts on those two sudden death semifinals. And as a doggy supporter, you can start with the GABA semifinal. Yeah, well, like I can't take off my smile from my face. What a game that was. Um, it, it's, it's in, it will be in our heart for a very, very long time. Maybe not just us as a uh, as a bulldog fans but anyone who sports footy would have that uh, game in his memory for a long time and uh, i don't think there was much separating um that two teams both were missing their key forwards uh, they were missing eric hip food uh, max tie a week before and it, it, it was like a, a disaster for them as well to lose uh, the players that close. And on the other hand, when it came to uh, Bulldogs, Cody Whiteman, like their, their, their main energy, their powerhouse um, was subbed out as well. Um, although it was replaced by a little bit of a power substation, John Johann Jason Johannesson, but still um, both the teams had their own issues. But I would still say it was a very close, hard-fought game. And the both teams, like just the, the margin that separates the two was like the true sort of reflection of the match. And the way both players play, uh, both teams play, played, I think they, they knew what was online and they played like that. But just in the end, uh, one team had to be the winner. And that, um, that, that was Bulldogs on that night. And each individual player, although uh, Brisbane had a very good advantage in the ruck, but um, they couldn't take too much of an advantage. The way uh, it was set up, the ball couldn't uh, get to their midfields as often as they would have liked. Um, so huge credit to Bever and his plan. Um, not just that, replacing uh, Eastern Wood on uh, Charlie Cameron uh, in the later part of the game with Teladrea. That was uh, the best thing he could do, where we see that he just saved Charlie Cameron scoring the last one point. Otherwise, it would have tied and gone into the uh, overtime. So God knows what would have happened then. Uh, I was just going to say, what's a game? What a game! It, it was fantastic to see uh, a game like that because if that's what we're going to see in the final, a very tight game, one point in the first quarter, one point in the second quarter, uh, and then only ten points between the two teams after half time in the third quarter, and the finish was one point between them. And you had to wait till the last second, the last kick, to see who's going to win the game. What a game and uh, what a final for uh, Sirius. George, what do you think? Yeah, gentlemen, uh, obviously, uh, Latham Vandermeer gets the credit for that scrappy Barry Breenstall behind that put the doggies one point up. I was for a moment thinking I was watching Collingwood St Kilda all day decades ago. Uh, but of course, uh, the real hero for me, as you mentioned, Habir Taylor Jurea, uh, when Charlie Cameron was bearing down on bearing down on goal with 49 seconds to go, stayed with him stride for strike, forced the ball out for a throw in. But the Brisbane Lions would be looking back on this performance and cursing their wasted opportunities. McCluckage was woefully inaccurate. Joe Danaher couldn't get into the game. They just didn't do enough of the one percenters and. Um, I think Joe Danaher needs to look back at the, at the highlights of the whole game and just look at some of his efforts where he allowed his opponents to move up forward and actually set up 
attacking plays for the dogs, which ended up in scores. Yeah, and I, I must say that Geelong came back uh, after a loss, and uh, GWS, to be honest, like they they were missing their um, star players. They've been missing their whole uh, their team uh, most of the time. Anyway, uh, a lot of players been injured, but uh, Toby Green, I suppose, that he was a big miss uh, for them, and um, Taylor at the back couldn't really do a job on. Uh, Hawkins as well, but that's that's the ideal uh, you can say Geelong team is where Hawkins kick, kick the bag of goals and uh, with the, uh, Gary Rohan and others they they, they chip in with that and uh, getting Redaglia into uh, the forward line I think that paid uh, huge dividends. Uh, he was he didn't do too much himself as I discussed in the last game with uh, Charlie Dixon, but he helped everyone around um, around him to score goals um, to be in the competition so I, that all in all that was very good and uh, with Zach to he back I think he uh, probably somehow filled the void which was created by Tom Stewart um, in, in in the back line so he he was good they held up well and then um, our old warriors in uh, uh, our uh, midfield Joel Selwood and superstar Dangerfield, he he played a very good game. Although we can see that he's he's not in his full form, his full mojo, but still he was there and he proved to the team uh, with the pressure he brought to the game. And it, it was never the case without the Toby Green um, that GWS Giants uh, would win because in, in in finals it's it's very hard to beat a composed team uh, like Geelong will which will punish you for any of your um, uh, any of your mistakes. Plus, they came in very heavily on GWS Giants and end up uh, winning with 35 points. I agree with you, Javier. Uh, they missed uh, Toby Green. and um, But let us not take it away from uh, Geelong. Geelong, they always come when it matters. And uh, let's have a look at um, Hawkins scored five goals. Great. And uh, what it looks like next week, uh, the dangerous players to watch out, uh, Sollywood and uh, Dangerfield, uh, Jamie Green and of course Hawkins. Uh, if they are on song, uh, they're, they're, Geelong will be unbeatable. What about you, George? What do you think? Yeah, Floyd, I'm looking at it uh, more as a, um, a wasted opportunity for GWS. Toby Green, I know we've said a lot about it, we don't need to keep reinforcing it, but um, yeah, a massive, massive blow for them not having him in. Leon Cameron, to his credit, he just got on with it. There was no whinging, there was no appealing. I believe he's coached brilliantly all year and it showed again against the Cats. Uh, to top it off, they lost Jesse Green before the opening bounce. So they're always going to be up against it, but to their credit, it was a never-say-die performance and they made Geelong really earn it. Shane Mumford, and what could be his last game for the, for the, cat, for the, for the Giants, end of his career, scored a goal after the three-quarter time Soren to give them some hope. And in the last quarter, the Giants came hard at the Cats, kicking three goals in the opening three minutes to get within 20 points. But the Cats, of course, were able to steady. Tom Hawkins, for mine, the man of the match, kicked two vital goals, kicked five for the evening, and has just stamped himself as one of the best forwards in the last 30 years. His final performances are second to none. Thank you. We'll be with you again after the break with our panel's views on some prolific and outstanding diversity players during this season. Tonight, our panel tackles the question of the most prolific and outstanding 2021 diversity players and their contribution to their side's performance. Fouad, you can tell us your selection, please. Uh, Port Adelaide's two players stand out, like Ilya Ilya. Of course, uh, he's had a great year. Uh, he's a, a, a great interceptor uh, defender, and uh, he uh, has he's been great for Port Adelaide. And young uh, Georgiades, uh, he had a fantastic year uh, in his debut. Of course, they got him from uh, Western Australia, uh, and he's a great uh, asset to Port Adelaide. He scored, as I said, two goals in his debut, and also he was the uh, nap rising star And when he scored three goals this year. So uh, I think they uh, they had a good year, and yeah. Well, a great choice, uh, Fawad. Uh, definitely, uh, Ali Ali and Georgiades are one of our 
two are very good multi multicultural players for us. And um, Bontum Pelli for me, uh, if I, that name I can think of when I look at multicultural players, he's he's been uh, awarded as the best uh, captain as well and MVP as well. Uh, I mean, that player is improving by the year, by, by the second, I would say, our multicultural player has been pivotal in um, the success of Bulldogs. He's been uh, leading that mi uh, midfield right from the front and helping uh, other players grow as well, new pe new players coming in. And uh, his, uh, his presence in the team has been just phenomenal. And um, he scored like 26 goals or so, whereas like in 2021 or so, he, he was hovering around 15-11. So great uh, player to have. And one of the greatest of all time, I believe, uh, Bonto Pelli. That's how he's going to end up. And the other one, Stephen Cornelia, a great player, obviously. Um, that's why he was offered um, a seven-year deal for about seven million or so. But this year hasn't been um, such a good year for him. He's only played like seven games or something like that. His uh, disposals have come down. His uh, influence in the clearances have come down. But um, he will, I, I suppose, bounce back the kind of player he is, maybe just because the injuries have taken a bit of a toll on him. Uh, plus, and the pressure of captaincy with Toby Green um, uh, slipping around here and there. Between him, people putting pressure on him that he should um, get rid of his captaincy. So he's been under pressure a lot. Um, I'm assuming that this break would do him a world of good and he will come back stronger. But definitely uh, one of the other multicultural players to look out for. Yeah, he'd be a great choice. As my, my, my selections are one of the greatest players to ever have played the game, Lance Buddy Franklin. Broke my heart when he left Hawthorne at the end of 2013 to join the Sydney Swans. And he's just been a fantastic player year after year. Of course, he had his injury concerns in recent seasons, but this year he got back to the best of Buddy Franklin. He showed that he's still at, at his age. He can match it. He can, he can, he can sort of match it with the best defenders. Still has the, the attributes and the skills that have made him famous. I also like Jack Silvani. He's been a malign player at the at the Blues. They've had the season from hell, but he's been one of the shining lights, I feel. A difficult season for him, obviously professionally and personally with the passing of his grandfather. But despite all of those setbacks, he's played well. And I hope that the Blues do offer him a contract. I, I've been reading with a great deal of surprise that they are yet to offer him another contract. So... I hope whoever the new coach is and the administration at Carlton sign him up very quickly because he's a terrific player and you can't have Carlton without the Silvani name. Thank you, guys. I know it is early in the position. Silly idea and speculation theory is bad. Can we look at the end of season coaching position musical chairs? What do you think, George? Well, Vanessa, it definitely is a silly season. Carlton probably... Uh, the number one team on that list, the number one club on that list. Ross Lyon has decided he doesn't want the Carlton job after all. One one moment is the red-hot favourite. Next minute he's left the Blues in the lurch. Collingwood, to their credit, they've finalised their selection of a new coach for next season, Craig McRae. I think that's an inspired choice. And mark my words, he could be the next Alastair Clarkson. Oh, Okay. So on that note, I, I believe Alistair Clarkson, I think he's keeping um, his cards close to his chest. He's uh, don't know he's going to uh, have a year off or what he's going to do. Uh, we've got no idea. But um, I, they, wherever he goes, I think um, whichever team has whatever coach, they will just replace uh, that coach with him. And um, Carlton, I think they, as you mentioned, I, I agree. I think um, the way they dealt with Teague, I think that's not good. And uh, maybe they could have just kept Teague and we know that Clarkson said that he's probably going to make his mind next year or so if that was the case. So anything they could have done, but it will be interesting what uh, it comes out next year. That's uh, I agree with you, uh, Javier. That's the greatest mistake Carlton did. Uh, they could have kept, as he said, uh, uh, Teague. And uh, 
then they uh, would have got their man next year because he wanted to have a year off. But the one that uh, I am thinking about is uh, comes from uh, Gold Coast Suns, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Stuart Jew for Ward. Stuart Jew. Stuart Jew. Yes, yeah, Stuart Jew. Uh, now, he's the only survivor out of the uh, coaching uh, panel. Uh, they've got rid of all the... Uh, uh, assistant uh, managers, but he is survived so far. But I don't think he will survive the year. So there must be, there could be another uh, opening there, and maybe that's why Ross Lyons has was drawn from uh, the uh, Carlton race. Actually, for now that you mention Alistair Clarkson, his immediate replacement Sam Mitchell, I think that's an inspired choice for the Hawks. He's a product of the club. He's served an apprenticeship interstate and he's also coached at the Box Hill Hawks so he knows the Hawthorne philosophy and the system. But does that mean George he has to retire from uh, uh, playing uh, now to concentrate on coaching? Yeah but but I, I think you, they should leave the uh, Alistair Clarkson shoes on the side and uh, Sam Mitchell gets his own shoes because I don't think anyone can fit into those shoes where we have the offshoots of Alistair Clarkson at the moment winning all the premiership, Hardwick, Beveridge, um, you name it, they, they, they are all over. Thank you. We'll be with you on the other side of this break with the previews of the preliminary finals and our panel tips. Welcome back. Starting tomorrow evening from Optus in Perth, the Melbourne Demons will be waiting for Geelong in what I imagine to be a shootout between the two sides all through the match. The team that kicks straight in front of goal will walk straight into the grand final. Then on Saturday night from Adelaide Oval, Port Adelaide, with a majority of home ground supporters intimidating the Western Bulldogs. George, what are your thoughts, please? Well, Vanessa, you only have to go back three weeks ago where Geelong, midway through or, or late in the third quarter, were up by 44 points. And somehow they found a way to lose the match. Melbourne staged a miraculous comeback. Melbourne cannot afford to give Geelong that kind of lead again because Geelong this time will shut the gate on the match. There, there is no way they will allow a repeat. Uh, they went into last week's match against GWS with a perfect mix. Radigalia came back, played up forward and was a second string ruckman to give Ray Stanley a chop out. They had Blitzarves in defence where he used his athleticism and his endurance to be able to run his, his opponents into the ground. So Melbourne will need to be on their guard right from the word go. They cannot, they cannot afford to give Geelong the, the space and the time to control the ball. Geelong have been fantastic all season in the way they've been able to monopolise the ball, slow down the play, play tempo football. Melbourne need to get the ball moving. They've been renowned all year for their ball movement. So it's important the likes of Oliver, Petraka, Viney win contests around the ground and be able to get their forwards into the play. I like Melbourne's defence, of course. The, the pairing of Jake Lever and Stephen may have been awesome all year. They're, they're an absolute colossus in defence. So it'll be interesting to see if Tom Hawkins overcomes that, that corky that he copped off Shane Mumford in their win last week. So Geelong, I think, have a few bumps and bruises. Melbourne have been resting. They're the fresher team. They need to start well rather than allow the Cats to jump them like they did, as, as we said, three weeks ago at Cadinia Park. Yeah, they both are very good teams at the moment. It's hard to find uh, any flaw in them. Uh, we've seen in, uh, in Melbourne that the forward line had a bit of a flaws, which came to the front in some of the games, but they've been able to um, galvanize and uh, uh, put their best game together when they are on full song. And uh, as you mentioned, they've had their rest. I think they will be coming, firing all cylinders. Their player, uh, players are fit. And this year, they they belong that it's their years. They, they've been... Uh, uh, they've been trying to come to this place from the last couple of years, but finally they've, they've got there. I don't think they will uh, let everyone come in their way. However, Geelong, as you mentioned, with the uh, 44 points up and the inclusions of 
Rettaglia and Tui this time, Zach Tui this time, I think that might make a difference. That 44 uh, point deficit, there is no chance that if, if they are ahead, that they, they, they're going to lose that game. All in all, it's going to be a great contest and a very, very good game to watch, I believe. Whoever comes on the top will totally deserve it. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, I'd like to add something to that, and I agree with what, whatever you said, you guys, because uh, Melbourne, if we go back to 2018, uh, they uh, finals, uh, they beat Geelong, and then they went and uh, beat, after that, they beat um, uh, Hawthorne, but they got demolished after that by Western West Coast Eagle by 51 points. So I think that... Uh, memory is still in their uh, uh, in their heads, and they want to rectify that because this is their year. They've got a young team; they're playing for each other, and uh, I think they're very confident. And um, yeah, and the other game, Western Bulldogs and Port Adelaide. Look, I must say, Port Adelaide have got their cavalry back; they've got the rest. Um, but Western Bulldogs have got the momentum. As as I said about um, uh, Melbourne, I think suddenly. With these two wins in the finals, they can see uh, the glimpse of 2016 in them. And uh, what that's doing is, like as we saw, that that game uh, against Brisbane went up and down, up and down. But they kept their head in and eventually they came out winners. And those hard-fought games uh, were the trademark of the Bulldogs in that year too. And they kept on losing plays that year as well, but in the end, they got through it. And I think Port Adelaide really have to get their work cut out. I don't think that this year, I believe Bulldogs haven't lost any interstate game and uh, crowd doesn't intimidate them anymore. Uh, no team uh, can intimidate them anymore. This year, uh, they, they're slowly starting to feel that it's their year. And um, the loss of Cody Whiteman, I think Bevo will uh, work something out. But Bontem Pelly, uh, it's still early days. We, we'll see what happens with him. But if he goes out, that, that'll be a big dent. Though. All in all, uh, I believe it's going to be a very hard-fought contest. And uh, uh, apart from the actual game, nothing's going to affect uh, the Bulldogs as such. Yeah, I agree with you. But let's face it, uh, great news happened today. I mean, uh, uh, 26,500, uh, they're going to fill the uh, Great Adelaide Oval. I think this is a big advantage, Habir, to uh, Port Adelaide. And I believe, uh, having a look at their forward line, Dixon, uh, Georgiadis, and uh, uh, Boak and all those guys, and, of course, Ilya in defence, uh, you can't go past that. Uh, and they have been confident uh, in the last few, we uh, f last few weeks, of course, because they've been winning comfortably. Uh, I didn't like the uh, performance of West uh, Western Bulldogs because they have, haven't been consistent. They've lost quite a few games in a row, uh, and they only won, uh, not convincingly, uh, against um, uh, the uh, Brisbane line by one point. So to me, uh, going to this game, uh, Port Adelaide might be a uh, favourite, but anything could happen in the uh, finals. George? Fouad, you're absolutely right. Port will be buoyed by their fanatical home support, and they've had the week off, just like the Melbourne Demons. You can't discount what a week's rest does for injured players. The Bulldogs, on the other hand, after that tough win against the Brisbane Lions, they're battered and bruised, and there is some doubt over Bontempelli's inclusion. Thank you, guys. Habib, what are your tips? Oh, well, for tips, it's Melbourne and Bulldogs for me. Good, thank you. Fouad, what are your selections, please? Uh, it's Port Adelaide and uh, Melbourne. I'm going to tip Port Adelaide to win comfortably against the Western Bulldogs. I don't have as much confidence in Melbourne only because Geelong are a fantastic side, but I will tip the Demons to have a narrow win. Thank you, George. Well, which brings me to my preliminary final tips. And well, honestly, I don't know, guys. My head says Melbourne and Port Adelaide, but my heart says Geelong and Western Bulldogs. And I'm going for with my heart, Geelong and Western Bulldogs. That is all we have time for this week. You can also watch us on Adelaide on Channel 44 Friday evenings, on Aurora Fox TV and Midday Saturday, and on the NBC YouTube. You are listening to this podcast on the Community Radio Network and the AFL Home and Away Diversity Language News 
will be back on national multicultural radio stations at the start of the 2022 season. I am Vanessa Gatica. I'm Herbie Singh. I'm George Gracias. And I'm Fuad Andreas. Thank you for being with us, and we shall leave you with the final quarter highlights of the Western Bulldogs and Brisbane Lions One Point Thriller. Thank you, and see you next week. Sensing this danger. This is the greatest!